Today I will present the syntax and semantics of first order logic. In particular, I will explain what terms, formulas, sentences and theories are. In the previous video, we have learned about structures. First order logic talks about structures. There are at least two ways how to use first order logic to talk about structures. The first is to use logic to describe entire classes of structures. You take a sentence or a theory and you look at the class of all structures that satisfy the sentence or the theory. The second way how to use logic is to fix a structure of interest and to study which relations or which functions are definable in that structure. Both of these ways are extremely important have many applications. A structure has a signature and this signature is used to talk about structures. This is the reason why some authors say language instead of signature. So to define the syntax of first order logic, we first fix a signature tau. We start with the definition of tau terms. These are strings of symbols that are defined inductively as follows. First, constant symbols in tau are tau terms. Constant symbols are function symbols of every T0. Second, variables are tau terms. And third, if T1 up to Tk are tau terms, and f is a function symbol from tau of every Tk, then f, opening bracket, T1, comma, and so on, until Tk, closing bracket, is a tau term. Note that item 1 is a special case of item 3. For example, polynomials over a field F are terms over the signature that contains plus and times, but also contains a constant symbol for each field element for the coefficients of the polynomial. You might also recognize propositional formulas as terms for the signature that contains a symbol for conjunction, negation, and top. As in the case of the syntax of propositional logic, one can show that each tau term has a unique tree-like structure. So just from looking at the string, we can reconstruct how the string was built inductively. We now define the semantics of tau terms relative to some tau structure. So we have some fixed tau structure A and some tau term T. We write T x1 up to xn to indicate that all variables that appear in T are from x1 up to xn. I don't insist that all variables really show up. I just want that all variables that are used come from x1 up to xn. Now, if I have T and this fixed string of variables x1 up to xn that may appear in T, then T describes over A an operation of every t n, which I will denote by t superscript a, and which is called the term function of t with respect to a, which informally is the operation we obtain by evaluating t over a. Formally, the definition of this operation is by induction. If t is a constant symbol, then the operation t superscript a is the operation that always returns the value for that constant symbol in the structure a. If t is a variable, then it must be equal to xi for some index i. In this case, t superscript a is defined to be the ith projection. That is, the operation of every t n that returns the ith argument. If t equals a function symbol of every tk built from the subterms t1 up to tk, then t superscript a is the operation obtained by composition. So inductively we already know the operations t1 superscript a and so on until tk superscript a and we first evaluate these operations and then apply the operation for f in a to the k results that we obtain. And this will then be the value returned by t, t superscript a. Here comes an important exercise. Let b be a tau structure and let g be a subset of b. 
I already said in the video about structures that there is a smallest substructure of A that contains G. It's called the substructure of B generated by G. This substructure must, for example, contain for every constant symbol C in the signature tau, the element C, superscript B. The task is to show that for every element a, little a of A, there exists a tau term T with variables x1 up to xn for some n and elements g1 up to gn from g, such that a, our element a, equals t superscript b applied to g1 up to gn. This is a very useful fact. We now define tau formulas. They are defined inductively. A first order formula is either of the form top, as in propositional logic, or of the form t1 equals t2. So here equals is really just a symbol for equality. And t1 and t2 are tau terms. Or the formula is of the form r opening bracket t1 comma and so on until tk closing bracket, where t1 up to tk are tau terms and r is a relation symbol from our signature tau of every tk. These three cases serve as the induction basis and they are called atomic formulas. Next, if phi is a tau formula, then not phi is a tau formula. If phi and psi are tau formulas, then phi, logical symbol for and, psi, is a tau formula. These two lines you also recognize from propositional logic. Finally, the next line presents something completely new. If x is a variable and phi is a tau formula, then exists x, phi is a tau formula. This symbol E turned by 180 degrees is the symbol for the existential quantifier. All other logical symbols that you might know are abbreviations for formulas that can be built inductively as I have just described it. We are freely using brackets in formulas to ensure that they are unambiguous. That is, that there is only one way how to build them inductively. For the signature of groups, an example of a tau formula is not exists an x such that not x plus zero equals x. For the readability of such formulas, it is of great help to use the following abbreviations. We write s not equals t instead of not s equals t. We write for all x phi instead of not exists x not phi. And here the symbol a that is turned upside down is the so-called universal quantifier. And we pronounce this formula for all x phi. So the formula above from our example over the signature of groups could be written as for all x, zero plus x equals x. And this expresses a property of groups that you surely know. However, I have not yet defined the meaning of such formulas. We now define the semantics of tau formulas. Again, this is relative to some tau structure. Let's call it A. We write phi x1 up to xn for a tau formula where all the free variables in phi come from x1 up to xn. Now I have to define what free variables are. Formally, this can be done by induction over the inductive definition of phi, but let me instead illustrate the idea with an example. I'm writing here some tau formula. The idea is that a variable is free if it is not existentially quantified. The subformula not r of x and not r of y, for instance, has two variables, 
and no quantifiers, so both variables x and y are free. The subformula that starts with exists x, exists y, has no free variables, because all of its variables are existentially quantified. On the other hand, the entire formula does have free variables again, because of its first conjunct, where x appears freely. Recall that each tau term t over the variables x1 up to xn describes over a an operation of RTN. We will describe in the following how the tau formula phi with free variables from x1 up to xn describes over a a relation of RTN. We write phi superscript a for this relation. The definition of this relation is again by induction over the inductive definition of the syntax of phi. If phi equals top, then phi superscript a is the set of all n tuples of elements of a. If phi equals term t1 equals term t2, then phi superscript a contains the set of all tuples such that if we evaluate t1 on that tuple and evaluate the term t2 on that tuple, we obtain the same value. If phi equals r of t1 up to tk, then phi superscript a contains all tuples such that if we apply the terms t1 up to tk on that tuple, we obtain a tuple that is in the relation for r in the, in the structure a. If phi equals phi1 and phi2, then the relation for phi is the intersection of the relations for phi1 and for phi2. If phi equals not psi, then the relation for phi is the complement of the relation for psi. Finally, if phi equals exists x psi, then the relation for phi can be obtained from the relation for psi by projecting to the first n arguments. In other words, we take the set of all n tuples of elements of A that can be extended to a tuple of length n plus 1 that lies in the relation for psi. We say that A satisfies or models phi of A1 up to An if the tuple A1 up to An is in the relation phi superscript A. Some specialized terminology will be helpful. A relation R of RET N over A is called first order definable in our structure A if there is a tau formula phi such that phi superscript A equals R. Two formulas phi and psi over the same variables x1 up to xn are called equivalent if phi and psi describe the same relation for every tau structure A. Sentences are first order formulas without free variables. If phi is a sentence, then phi superscript A must be a relation of RET0. It is important to note that there are two such relations. The relation that contains the tuple of length 0 and the empty relation. In the first case, A satisfies phi. We also say that phi is true in A. In the second case, A does not satisfy phi. This is equivalent to saying that A satisfies not phi. Let's have a look at an example. Suppose that phi is the formula for all x, y, such that x is strictly smaller than y. There exists a z that lies strictly between x and y. For the strictly smaller than relation, we typically use infix notation. Also, very often we omit repeated quantifiers of the same type. The implication symbol is just a shortcut, as in propositional logic. Note that a structure that carries a linear order satisfies this sentence if and only if the order is dense. So the usual order of the rationals satisfies this sentence, while the usual order of the integers does not. And here comes the final definition for today. Theories. A tau theory is simply a set of tau sentences. A structure A 
with the signature tau, satisfies a tau theory T if A satisfies all sentences in T. In this case, we also say that A is a model of T. The point here is that this set uh, can be infinite. So theories offer the possibility of infinite conjunctions. Note that formulas and sentences must always have finite length, but theories can be infinite. A theory is called satisfiable if it has a model. We say that T implies phi if every model of T also satisfies phi. A tau theory is called complete if T is satisfiable and for every tau sentence either T implies phi or T implies not phi. Where do complete tau theories come from? Well, one way to produce such theories is that you pick your favorite tau structure A and you take as theory T the set of all tau sentences that hold in A. This will certainly be satisfiable and every sentence either holds in A or it does not hold in A, so T is complete. 